Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. We believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, a power struggle in city council as older people reach a stalemate in ward map negotiations, how the map impacts Chicagoans. A new docuseries shining light on the unsolved killings of 51 Chicago women. We speak with two activists at the forefront of a movement seeking answers. Brown is not just brown. Light brown is not just light brown and a makeup brand with staying power. How a new makeover for cosmetics brand Fashion Fair is keeping the hometown company fresh after 48 years. And first off tonight, Chicago older people are at odds over redrawing the city's ward map, a procedure that happens every 10 years to account for population changes. The biggest sticking point is the balance of power between black and Latino Chicagoans. The latest proposal, backed by the Black Caucus, would reduce the number of majority black wards from 18 to 16, and increase the number of Latino majority wards from 13 to 14. But the Latino caucus is holding firm and refusing to accept fewer than 15 wards. That group filed its map proposal with the city clerk's office Thursday, triggering, for now, the first public referendum of its kind in 30 years. Knowing that this once in a decade remap was coming up this year, the Latino caucus collectively decided months ago that we needed to do three things advocate for a fair map that follows the census data, have conversations at public meetings with community members, work collaboratively with aldermen outside of our caucus to draw a fair map that followed the Voting Rights Act. And that's exactly what we did. Now city council members now have until mid-May to continue negotiations and agree on a map or it will be up to the public in June. Joining us now as part of a special crossover discussion with Chicago Tonight Latino Voices are Chandra Van Dyke, project manager of the Chicago Advisory Redistricting Commission launched by Change Illinois. Aisha Butler, co-founder and CEO of the Resident Association of Greater Inglewood, also known as RAGE. Juan Morado Jr., Chicago attorney and member of the Illinois Latino Agenda Coalition. And Robert Vargas, professor of sociology at the University of Chicago. Welcome all of you to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Chandra Van Dyke, let's start with you, please. You were part of creating the People's Map. Uh, it's another map that's backed by uh, Chicago residents, but it does not yet have the support of the 10 older people that it would need, uh, but it would create 15 majority black wards, 14 majority Latino wards, and one Asian American majority ward. Why do you believe this is the best option for the city? Ultimately, because the People's Map has 37 minority majority wards more than any other map proposal. It was the first map to empower the Asian American community by drafting the first Asian ward and showing that it is possible to have such. Um, it's the only map proposal that was created with input from residents of the city of Chicago and drawn in the public's eye. Juan Morado Jr., what is the Latino Agenda 2.0's position uh, on the map that's been presented by the Latino Caucus, uh, that's been presented by that, that planning council? I'll tell you in concept, we are absolutely in support of 15 Latino majority wards here in the city. And so uh, we like the idea that this map puts forward that, but more importantly, we also like the idea that it's equitable across the city. It creates, as Chandra described, the first Asian majority ward here in the city of Chicago, which is long overdue, and also ensures that there are stronger black majority wards throughout the city of Chicago while keeping communities contiguous and compact. Now, one, the Black Caucus, if it's willing to go from 18 down to 16 wards in the latest map that, that it's proposed uh, previously, they were only willing to give up one ward. Um, would mm -hmm. the Latino Caucus be meeting them halfway if the Latino Caucus were to agree to 14 majority Latino wards as the Black Caucus proposes? I don't necessarily view that as meeting them halfway. I actually view that as us leaving something on the table. Um, 
when you look at the makeup of the city with Latinos making up 30% of the city's population now, and just using simple math, we should have at least 15 majority wards here in the city where Latinos have an opportunity to elect an individual that can represent best represent them. And in many cases, we hope that's going to be a Latino. Asia Butler, your organization Rage, you all did not endorse the People's Map. Why not? Um, we have over 400 members who have their own very strong opinions and voices. Um, the People's Map put Inglewood into one um, actual ward. Um, some of our members were for that. Some of them were highly against that. And so we just, as a consensus, cannot come up to say together that we can endorse the, the people's map. Um, we have had them at our village meetings. We praised the process. We enjoyed the process with them. Um, but unfortunately, we just couldn't as an organization um, endorse it. Asia, are there concerns uh, in the community about population shifts and the black representation in city council uh, possibly being reduced? It is. I mean, it's a reality um, just from residents in general. I think, you know, especially folks who are living in West Inglewood already and starting to see that their neighborhood is changing. They already feel like they're losing some footing in, in West Inglewood. And so I think the idea, you know, not even, you know, knowing the facts or the math of the population, just the idea that, you know, we might not be represented the way that we're supposed to based on our population is scary for a lot of folks. And so, um, and, and, and we have some aldermen that some of our members work very closely with and have great relationships with and the threat of possibly losing that relationship um, and that actual ward is, is a concern. Robert Vargas, I want to bring you in. You know, historically speaking, has having aldermen of the same race uh, representing that majority of constituents, has that always better served that group's interests? Um, it's been mixed. It's been very mixed. So in the 1960s, when, as a result of the Voting Rights Act, when uh, Mayor Daley created black majority wards throughout the South and West Sides, those wards were uh, drawn in a way to help elect uh, African-American city council members who actually opposed civil rights legislation and opposed the civil rights marches and Martin Luther King. Um, historically, the, these, these deeply racialized framings of black versus Latino have been used as ways to hide some of the other interests that elected officials are, are putting forth and enacting with the maps that they're drawing. Chandra, what is your reaction to this, you know, I guess it's maybe a dispute between the Black and Latino caucuses. How does this get resolved? Uh, well, ultimately, we feel the race should be secondary when Ottoman are carbon awards in a way that makes it most difficult for residents to be able to access basic resources. And so the People's Map thought, well, the, the commission that created the People's Map thought it was best to get the input of the residents who are living in these communities and know the conditions of their communities and understand the boundaries that make up their communities. And they should have a voice in that process. And so ultimately that's what the commission created to empower the residents so that they can have a voice in how their communities are functioning. If this should go to a referendum, Chandra, are voters going to be engaged enough, you know, to go out and vote so that this truly is a people's map? Oh, well, I think we are definitely living in a revolutionary time. People are engaging differently, not just around voter empowerment, but ultimately about what's best for them in their communities. People have worked to develop quality of life plans. People have come together to develop organizations like RAGE so that residents can have a voice in how their, their, their communities function ultimately, the conditions of their communities, the qualities of their lives. So, I believe 100% if given the opportunity, the people of Chicago will vote for the People's Map because it strives to keep the communities whole and empower residents so that they can have a voice in their communities. Asia Butler, the 2020 census uh, showed significant shifts in Chicago's demographics. We know that the city's black population is now smaller than the city's Latino population, 28.7% compared to 29.9%. Um, do these population changes, should they not be reflected in the wards? Um, I definitely agree it should be reflected in the wards. I mean, it's 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 inevitable that we've had black flight, you know, here in the city of Chicago. Um, and we cannot ignore the fact that it, it hasn't been um, what has happened in the city of Chicago hasn't been in the best interest of black people, which is why many of them are leaving. Um, but it, it's the reality. And I mean, and in, in we're, we're ever changing, we're an ever changing city. And you cannot, you know, deny reported or not on the census, you know, the population changes that are happening in the city. We lost, we are the large, 
our community lost the most African Americans out of all the, the South Side community. So it's hard for us. I mean, we were a 99%, almost 100% African American community, and now we're about 94%. And I think that's going to continue to change. Okay, obviously not an uncomplicated uh, discussion, which is why we're <laughs> having this this special edition of the um, uh, Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, Black Voices uh, cross on, crossover conversation. Uh, I want to thank our guests. Um, and of course, be sure to tune into Chicago Tonight Latino Voices for more of this expanded conversation, including how gerrymandering impacts communities and why it can be sometimes harmful. Of course, our thanks to Chandra Van Dyke, Asia Butler, Juan Morado Jr., and Robert Vargas. And a new docu-series is bringing national attention to the unsolved homicides of dozens of Chicago women. The Hunt for the Chicago Strangler is a three-part docu-series fo focused on the disappearances of at least 51 Chicago women who were all found strangled from 2001 to 2018. It's now streaming on Discovery Plus. Here's a look at episode one. I think the rest of the world hears Chicago and the first thing they think about is crime and murder, mayhem. No one's really having conversations about the 50 murder missing women that this city has lost. We want for her. We want for her. Tonight, hundreds call for something to be done on behalf of Chicago's black and brown women and girls murdered or missing, their case is unsolved. Our sister was found dead here. I mean, this was a dirty alley with garbage cans back here. You're talking about women who were thrown in the trash, who were found in abandoned buildings, like horrors that were just blips in the news, if at all. Most of the women killed were black and their cases were largely ignored by the media. Activists have since called on police and the media to pay more attention, arguing there's a serial killer or killers on the loose. Joining us are Jennifer Anderson, director of The Hunt for the Chicago Strangler, Reverend Robin Hood, and activist Beverly Reed Scott. Both she and Reverend Hood are featured in the docuseries and have been raising awareness about these strangulation cases for years. Uh, welcome all of you to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Thank you for joining us. Jennifer Anderson, let's start with you, please. Why did you want to create this docuseries? Uh, well, I... Um... I, I didn't actually, um, I wasn't involved in the, the development portion of it. I do want to be clear about that. The, the production company, um, Entertainment One, worked on this for about a year before I came on board. And I came on board when uh, Discovery greenlit the series. But I'd been following the development of it. Um, and, you know, it, when, when Discovery greenlit the series, which was about a year and a half ago, um, this country was having long overdue conversations about race and systemic racism and um, black women in particular um, and how their murders or when they go missing, um, their cases do not get the same attention as other cases. Um, so it really, I, I guess I always knew I wanted to do this series, but um, it really did seem like a, it's such an opportunity to um, put something back into the, the, you know, put something into the overall conversation. Um, to shed some light on something that you felt that had not been discussed, it sounds like. Exactly. Beverly Reed Scott, why do you think these cases have gone unsolved for so long? Oh, unfortunately, um, in our society, not just Chicago, but um, in the United States, uh, Black women are the least of us. And so when uh, crimes happen, as horrific as what has occurred over these 20 years um, with these ladies, and there is no outrage, um, I think if they were white women, they would certainly have brought out all, all the stops. Um, we are the least and the last, but I hope with this docu-series, we can demonstrate our humanity and insist upon having justice for these ladies. 
Now, the docuseries, it highlights the story of Nancy Walker, one of the at least 51 women found strangled. She was found in 2002, um, and there's a moment uh, in the docuseries that highlights how the media handled her disappearance at the time. Let's take a listen. Some of the reporters even said to me, because they know me, you know, if you weren't involved, we wouldn't have come to cover it. Exactly. And this was during the time of the Peterson. Yes. My sister was missing the same exact time that Lacey, Lacey Peterson. Peterson was missing. You know, Lacey Peterson at the time had no connection whatsoever to Chicago, but somehow a white woman in California gets to be on the front page of a Chicago newspaper, but a black woman from Chicago gets to be at the back of the newspaper. You know, as a black woman, it's insulting. As a former reporter, it's insulting. And how is it that Lacey Peterson was on page one of the Chicago newspapers and Nancy was on page 57? Reverend Hood, this was nearly 20 years ago. Do you think that there has been progress in how missing black women are covered today compared to then? No, there haven't been any progress. We're still in the same place we were in 1999 when these bodies have actually uh, come up missing and dead and women came up dead. Uh, the movement is starting to happen. And I believe this docuseries is going to elevate that movement. Uh, one thing I understand, if you put a lot of light on something, eventually it's going to be seen. And that's why this docuseries was so important to me because Discovery Plus did exactly what needed to be done. They cut the cameras on, and that's what it takes. Reverend Hood, you know, I've, you say that the coverage has not quite been the same. Do you think there's been some movement as of late? I know that WVON has, the radio station here has started its own coverage. HBO has released uh, Black and Missing. There's obviously this one by Discovery Plus. Is, are you seeing any movement, some traction? Well, right now, the only movement I've seen is that the FBI is working closer with the uh, CPD detectives. And my hopes is that CPD learns something from them. Uh, some of this work we had to do, we had to go and literally force the state to accept rapid DNA. And we couldn't understand it because the FBI has it. The armed forces have rapid DNA. You can get the answer in 45 to 60 minutes. So that's the only movement that I've seen here of late. But the jury is still out. We're going to see what happened over the next few months while we're still doing the work. And Jennifer, as director of this docuseries, what do you want viewers to take away from the stories of these women and their families? I think it's very important to see these women as the real human beings that they were. I think it's very important to experience the prolonged grief um, that the families are experiencing. Um, I think, you know, these women are not just a name on, you know, a spreadsheet or in a police file. They had real lives and we're missing something because they're not here, as Beverly has often said. Um, and, you know, they deserve justice just as much as anybody else does. Beverly Reed Scott, how can activists like yourself work with police to solve some of these cases? Because obviously there is tension in some of the communities where these women come from. There's tension between the folks in those communities and the police officers who patrol them. You know, that's a great question. And um, what I've tried to do in my um, work, which I consider to be more of a calling than activism, is to go to the, um, I've been working with the chief of detectives, um, Brendan Dinahan, uh, trying to um, ensure that the humanity of these ladies is what is placed in front of him. Um, not the, the anger, but to open his mind and heart so that he views these ladies in the same way that he would view other ladies that get that kind of um, attention, like as uh, Delmarie said about uh, Lacey Peterson. So that's my role here, is to bring some love, some light, some soul, and some insistence 
that we be elevated to our rightful place as black women. And before I let you go, I want to ask you briefly, you know, both you and Reverend Hood, now that these cases are getting some more attention nationwide, are you hopeful that there will be some resolutions? Oh, I have a strong expectation that there will be resolution. Um, there are some strong leads right now, as you will see in the um, series. And uh, I just, I have that faith and tenacity because I'm going to stay with it until it's resolved. That's a good tease to get people to watch the program as well. Uh, Reverend Hood, about 15 seconds, same question to you, though. Do you, are you hopeful for some resolutions? Uh, yes, because our young folks are vigilant. Tomorrow we're doing a press conference before we do the viewing, and it's going to be young folks. Uh, I always tell them young folks this is for war, and old men like me is for counsel. <laughs> and they're vigilant. And, and our young ladies, mother calls the violence everywhere, youth calls the violence everywhere. They're not going away. And I'm sure they will and, be coming to you for, for some counsel. That's um, Unfortunately, we are out of time. Jennifer Anderson, Beverly Reed Scott, and Reverend Robin Hood, thanks to the three of you for joining us. Thank you. And there's more Chicago Tonight Black Voices ahead, so stay with us. Many black women may be familiar with the cosmetics brand Fashion Fair, founded in 1973 by Eunice Johnson, wife of John Johnson, the black publishing magnate behind Ebony and Jet magazines. Though the publishing house is no longer what it used to be, new ownership has given Fashion Fair its own makeover and returned it to store shelves. With names like Chocolate Darling, Caramel Fresh, and Brown Sugar Babe, it's clear just who these shades are for from foundation to lip color. I'm wearing the fine chestnut. Lace is my all-time favorite. This lipstick that I have on, it is um, African violet. The iconic Fashion Fair Cosmetics brand wants women of color to know it's time to reapply. We started 56 years ago. We were, if not the first, close to the first. And we've always focused on darker skin tones. It wasn't novel. It wasn't something that, you know, we thought like, wow, isn't this hip and cool to do? Let's be politically correct. It didn't exist. Founded in 1973 by Eunice Johnson of Johnson Publishing, Fashion Fair catered to black women who could afford the department store prices for cosmetics that suited their spectrum of skin tone. So for me, it was my first makeup. It was the first makeup my mother allowed me to use. And so that is a big deal in any girl's life because all of us, when we're young, we want to wear something. Packaged in iconic pink tubes and compact cases, the brand was seen on hundreds of Ebony Fashion Fair models, as well as fashion show audience members over the years. But as Johnson Publishing was filing for bankruptcy in 2019, it sold Fashion Fair to two former executives, Desiree Rogers and Cheryl Mayberry McKissick. The two women, along with another partner, scooped it up with plans of returning it to its former glory. So the opportunity to take the historical legacy that Fashion Fair has been known for, you know, around the world, and certainly all the work that Mrs. Johnson did bringing Fashion Fair into the marketplace, it's, it's wonderful, but yet a little bit scary because there's a history and there's a legacy, and we've got to make sure that we do it right. Chicago native and celebrity makeup artist Sam Fine returned to help redevelop the product. And what's beautiful about the nude shades is that there's a range of nude shades. Today's fashion fair is vegan and includes natural additives like vitamin C and green tea extract to provide a skincare benefit. A range of lipsticks and foundations in both new and legacy colors are now presented in white and gold packaging, perched on the shelves of retail beauty giant Sephora instead of department store counters. So being able to say that um, you, you can go to this gondola and find something for your cousin, your sister, and your aunt, I think is unique because many of the brands, even in their, their shade extensions, don't really speak to the nuances of, of coloring that, uh, that, that speak to us so beautifully.
But Fashion Fair's comeback arrives at a time when women of color already have far more choices than in the late 20th century. Heritage brands have extended their lines to include darker shades, and Rihanna's all-inclusive Fenty Beauty line has sold enough to turn the pop star into a billionaire business mogul. This is a quick way to make my eyes look instantly brighter. Research shows that black women alone spent about $1.3 billion on color cosmetics in 2020, down from nearly $1.7 billion in 2019, likely because of the pandemic. Owners Rogers and McKissick say while there's room for everyone, Fashion Fair is the original, and its new makeover is for those who knew it when and fresh faces who can get to know it now. They're also going to see us in, I think, a very different way. And it really is about us really focusing on women with darker skin tones. Uh, that's, that's our number one focus. We don't do anything else. The team also owns Black Opal Cosmetics, a mass market makeup brand devoted to black women as well, sold in drugstores and Ulta. And that's our show for this weekend. If you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Black Voices and Latino Voices on Sundays beginning at 10 p.m. And join me and Paris Schutz next week at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm which is proud to honor founder and senior partner Robert A. Clifford and partner Shannon McNulty for their award for excellence in pro bono and public interest service.